Hey, what's going on, party people? This your man Griff here. Um, here in a Zoom with my um, accountant Rob for over 20 years, uh, Rob Turner, and he's going to just break it down to you plain and simple, answer some questions that we put out on a survey concerning about having a business, LLC, D D DBA, all of those different things. And I'm just going to turn it right on over to him. So, Rob, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're having a wonderful and blessed day. Well, today I'm going to address uh, many of the concerns that uh, uh, many of you have had. And um, so I call this the uh, mobile notary income tax tips. And so I'll start out with just some basic skills that uh, in any business format that you uh, would have, and those are such things as you, you got to come up with some kind of strategic uh, management plan as to how you're going to do business and what form of business you're going to uh, have, such as sole proprietor, LLC, as corporation partnership. So these basic skills I'm about, about to go over with you, um, doesn't matter which of those uh, structures that you use, these are all uh, need to be present. So again, we start off with, you know, a basic strategic management plan, um, you know, some basic accounting, and it doesn't matter whether you're doing, uh, whether you have a knowledge of all of these skills yourself, but you need to pull together some kind of team um, that has knowledge of these different things. You know, another aspect of uh, being in business and running a business is having a marketing plan or strategy. You know, how are you going to generate income? Uh, another is the actual sales, you know, coming up with a plan or strategy of, of how you're actually going to generate sales, how you're actually going to operate the business. And one of the big things, as I pointed out before, and that is keeping your business life and finances separated from the personal um, business and finances. That is very key um, when you're in business. So it doesn't matter which form of business that you choose. It's very key that you keep your personal life and your business life separate. And so um, one of the other key factors when you're in business, and that is to get an employer identification number. You know, some of you or many of you may know it as an EIN. And so whatever form of business you, that you're in, you want to get an employer ID number. And so once you have that, any business forms or applications or uh, any uh, thing you're doing in the business, you want to avoid, if possible, using your social security number and um, use the employee ID number. The, when you start a business, the business becomes a separate entity. So the employee ID number is the identification for that business. So I would always recommend that you use your employee ID number as opposed to your social security number. And so these uh, skills or processes are common, does not matter uh, whether you're a sole proprietor or a LLC. Next, I'll go into um, explaining some differences in whether you're uh, a sole proprietor versus being an LLC. As a sole proprietor, that is one of the easiest forms of business to, um, to create. And a sole proprietor, that simply means that there's one owner. So you're the boss, you're the manager, you're the, you're the everything. <laughs> now, you can hire out those services, but by the name itself, it implies in terms of ownership, you are the owner. One of the key factors of being a sole proprietor is that you have unlimited personal liability. So in, in the world we live in today, um, people are always, you know, looking to try to take advantage of a situation. And by that, I mean, they want to sue you for something. So in the notary business, a good example of that is 
you know, as a mobile notary, you're going out to people's residences or their businesses, or you're meeting them someplace. But let's say you're um, driving up on their property, and um, you, you know, happen to run over their mailbox, or you happen to run over their cat and kill the cat or the dog, and you know, it wasn't your intent, but as a sole proprietor, if they choose to sue you, they're suing not just the business, but you are the um, sole proprietor and you have unlimited li personal liability. So they'll also sue you and sue you for whatever uh, assets that you have. Gotcha. Okay. So now, so as a LLC, it's a lot more detailed and, and more expense to get that business started. And so here in Virginia, um, that requires that you go to the State Corporation Commission, um, you know, to uh, apply to become an owner of an LLC. And you, similar to being a sole proprietor, you can be a sole owner. You don't have to have uh, multiple owners, but you could. Um, but the big key, uh, once you become an LLC, and as I mentioned earlier, you keep your business financial life and your personal financial life separately, you no longer have personal liability. The assets and all of the uh, LLC is, if the LLC you know, creates a problem and someone sues, they're suing the LLC and not you personally. So um, uh, LLC is highly recommended in that you be, form the LLC, it's a little bit more expensive and a little bit more paperwork to get it formed. Mm -hmm. But once you form it, one of the key things you want to do is limit your personal liability exposure. Gotcha. And so the process of creating an LLC, um, the first thing you want to do, and I'm going to relate everything to being here in Virginia, <clears throat> and, that, and that is to go to the State Corporation Commission and search and see if the name that you would like to operate under to make sure that somebody else is not already using that, that name. You know, um, in many cases, uh, people choose to uh, actually create or start the business and pick a name they probably have been uh, wanting to use for a long period of time and only to find out they've started doing business under that name. But now they only find out that when they go to actually record or register that name, somebody else is using that name. So before you get started buying business cards or letterhead or website um, where you have picked a name, you want to make sure that that name is available for you to use. So once you have done the search and the name you pick is available, um, you can secure that name. And if you're actually not ready to start the business, you can actually um, secure that name until you do, are ready to get started. Um, so once you've done the search and you um, come up with a name, then you actually fill out the paperwork to actually create a LLC. The next thing you wanna do is to get an employer ID number. And with those documents, uh, you now have what paperwork you need to go to the bank to open up a business bank account. So um, the next thing or subject we'll talk about is the DBA. Um, so what I have, uh, what I understand that there are many, you know, lots of people are out there on the internet and they, you know, we'll try to uh, provide you with bits of information, but, you know, you got to be real careful and, and know whether it's the right information that's out there. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, mobile notaries have been advised is to, that they can operate as a DBA, which simply means doing business as. Well, I'm going to tell you what DBA is and what DBA is not. And so, excuse me. I see Ben. 
Okay, so how you doing, ma'am? <laughs> so a DBA is an assumed or trade name. And to operate as a DBA, you actually have to have an existing business. So what that means, so if you actually have an existing business and you want to branch out into a, say you want a, a, a different revenue stream that's somewhat related to what you're doing, um, just say, for instance, let's say you're doing uh, shoe repair or you're selling shoes and you decide, hmm, this is going well. I think I'm a branch into selling women's clothes. Well, you might want to come up with a different catchy name for the women's clothes line. So then you could now ha have your existing business, but doing DBA, doing business as this women's clothing line. So, but you had to have had the existing business to register and to, um, you know, do become a, a DBA. Now, a point I just mentioned, you actually have to have an existing business and then you actually have to register the DBA name. Again, that's, you know, done through the State Corporation Commission. So, um, you know, everything involves some kind of, <laughs> some kind of paperwork. Um, but you can't just simply decide you're going to be a DBA. You have to be an existing business and you can actually fill out or register to use a different name if you have a different revenue stream. Um, a DBA is simply, a, you're simply notifying the public that this business entity is being conducted under a different name. That's what a DBA actually is doing. You're simply notifying the public that this business entity or different product line that you have is conducting business under another name. Now, let's go into what a DBA is not, okay? A DBA is not the same as forming a business or business entity. It is not the same as forming a business or business entity. If you're operating a business and you have not registered it, you technically uh, are a sole proprietor. Now, if you're gonna be a sole proprietor, get registered, get employee ID number, but the fact that you have decided or someone recommended that you be a DBA uh, does not mean you actually have formed a business. The other thing, uh, under the DBA, you, uh, you don't have the liability protection uh, because you're not actually a business. And so again, with the example from earlier, you run, you drive up on someone's property and they're going to sue you. And so, um, you know, you have no liability protection. So you want to create what, whatever business entity you decide to do, what, you know, is best for you. And that's something I can help you um, decide. But saying you, you are a DBA doesn't mean anything. Uh, another aspect of being a DBA is um, you, if you're not an existing corporation, you can't choose to be a DBA that's with incorporation behind the name. Like if you're ABC notary, you can't choose to be doing business as ABC notary incorporated. So if you're not already incorporated, you can't choose to you know, with a different revenue stream, you can't choose to be uh, a DBA as a corporation. Now, a uh, couple of things that I have at title as an absolute no-no, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm hearing on the internet as I have done some research on uh, mobile notaries and the term of being a 1099, a 1099 is a form. <laughs> That's not a business. That is simply a form. So you can't be a form. So you can operate a business, in which case you need to create and register a business. 
but the, the idea of you being a 1099, a 1099 is the form that if you individually uh, for personal service provide, uh, have earned over $600 for uh, the year, they'll be issuing you a 1099 um, showing the amount of money that uh, someone has paid you, but you are not a 1099. A 1099, uh, when you know people say, uh, you know, you are a 1099, that does not create a business entity. Again, a 1099 is simply a form that re that is used to uh, state or reflect how much income that you uh, have made when it's over six hundred dollars. And so, again, there's no such thing as you being a 1099. Okay, next we'll go into, um, you know, many of you uh, mobile notaries are just starting out in business and generally to start out in business because the business does not exist, exist there's some fees that you have to pay to register the business. So, you know, those fees got to come from somewhere. So where they normally come from is from your personal finances. So, those startup expenses, you know, you use your personal funds to start the business. You can actually reimburse yourself for those funds that you use from your personal to start the business. And the way you do that is that you write one, you have at that point have started the business, you've done the necessary paperwork to register the business and you've actually opened up a business account. Well, what you do is write yourself a check from the business account for the exact amount of the reimbursement. And that doesn't mean that you've got to uh, pay all of it back at one time. So let's say over okay. the course of getting a business started, you let's say you incurred $500 of uh, startup expenses. And let's say that was four different things of $125. Well, you can use each receipt and reimburse as money is available. You know, don't break the, the, the business, um, you know, taking all of the money back out of the business, but, you right. know, as money okay. is generated. Right. And so the other side to that is those expenses receipts that you use to start up the business, those are still business receipts. Okay. So that's why you need to write a check for the exact amount of the receipt that you're being re reimbursed so that you can match up your paperwork um, so that you have a, a, a check that's for the same amount as the business expense. And you simply keep those receipts you know, with other business records. Gotcha. Okay. So just basically anything that you're putting out. And then I would also have to ask some people are getting help from family. So a family loaned you a couple of hundred dollars to buy a printer and then you wanted to reimburse them. You would do the same method. It's, it's the same process. So write them, you know, the, uh, write them a check for the, that, for the same amount of, as the receipt. Gotcha. You know, so let's say that using that, that uh, family member situation, the family member loaned you $200. So you bought a printer for $159.78. Write one check for $159.78. The other money, you may have gone to Office Depot and bought mm -hmm. some pens and notebooks. And, and so... Again, write the check for the exact amount of okay. the receipt gotcha. so that you get to marry up, um, okay. you know, the, the reimbursement so that you're not just, uh, you know, you're not just stating, oh, I gave so-and-so the money. Okay. By marrying up, by writing the check for the actual amount of the receipts, now your paperwork marries up and it's a, uh, easy explanation for IRS. Gotcha. Okay. So um, next we'll move into, you know, 
several people ask the question in different kind of ways that either as a sole proprietor or as a LLC, are you able to, you the owner, are you able to pay yourself a salary from a sole proprietor uh, or from an LLC? And the answer absolutely is no. Uh, those two forms of business, you're not uh, able to pay the owner, which is yourself, you're not able to pay yourself a salary from that business. What you do as you uh, uh, make net income from the business, um, you have to set up and maintain what's called a draw account. Okay. So you, you're able to draw uh, money from the business, write yourself a, a check, mm -hmm. consider it a draw, take that check and deposit into your personal account. Now you can pay your rent, personal bills or whatever from your personal account. But that draw account is not a deduction from the business. Right. You are simply using the money that would be yours anyway. Okay. Okay. So it has to be a check. Can it be like you go to the bank and ask them to withdraw X amount of dollars out and then you go deposit it into your account via the ATM? Yes, absolutely. That You okay. can do it that way. So, you know, and most people are using uh, debit cards these days. So what you want to do if you, you know, needed to draw money out of the business and convert it to personal, you could go to the ATM machine, draw it out, print the receipt. Gotcha. Yeah, print the receipt. On the back of the receipt, on the front of the, or on the receipt, you want to put on it that it's for, um, it's part of your, the draw account. Okay. Okay. And so now that becomes, so it's, you know, many people are, just, are operating with debit cards as opposed to checks. Sometimes people, you know, I know many folks are not even, uh, don't even get checks printed because they're paying with everything through the debit card. Correct. So again, that's a, a, just another option to do it. But on the receipt, you want to document on the receipt that this was a draw. A draw. Okay. Again, draw the money out and then <clears throat> the owner's draw, basically. The owner's draw. And so uh, you know, then it's in the form of cash. So you could either long as you uh, document that it's a draw, you can then take that money and either deposit it into your checking a personal account mm -hmm. or you could pay for whatever you're doing with cash. Gotcha. But the key is that you have documented when you went to the you know, ATM machine and drew mm -hmm. the money out right. on the receipts. You actually documented just what you, what it was that you were doing. Okay. All right. Makes sense. hundred uh, percent. So the next thing we'll go into and talk about is automobile expenses. Okay. All right. So there's, um, there's two different ways of handling auto expenses, but under either method, what you have to keep up with is the business mileage that you incur related to the business. And so there are lots of apps uh, that are out there now uh, that are, you know, uh, people are using to keep track of their business mileage. And so um, I am a former IRS agent. And as long as you do things, um, uh, consistently IRS is okay with that. And so with these different apps, it has made life so much easier because now you get to document on a regular basis and you have an electronic version um, to document or support what it is that you're doing. So, um, you know, in these different apps, you just document, you know, where you're going, you went to an appointment, you went to the bank, you went to, Office Max, you went to uh, where it is that you may be going that was related to the business. And so <clears throat> you use these applications to support your business models. And so, again, under either the, the methods that you use, you got to keep up with the business models. So 
under option A, you use the standard mileage rate. And so for 2021, they have uh, uh, set that at 56 cents per mile. And so under the standard mileage rate, that is taken into consideration all the different expenses related to the car and okay. IRS is, that's how they've come up with that number of 56 cents a mile. So that's taken into consideration if you're making payments on it, your insurance, gas, uh, repairs, uh, anything related to the you know tires, tune-ups, mm -hmm. oil changes, anything <clears throat> related to the operation of the vehicle, IRS has come up with a simplified way that uh, you don't have to save all of the receipts from okay. all those different things. And many gotcha. people prefer doing that because it's easy to keep up with the mileage, especially if you're using one of the, um, the apps that you can have on your phone. And you don't have to keep up with every little gas, repair, tune-up, oil change. You don't have to keep up with those um, right. receipts. You just simply take the amount of mileage times um, 56 cents a mile. And mm -hmm. so just say in the course of a month, um, you know, you drive an average, say, of a uh, thousand business miles a month. Right. What that equates to is you have $560 of auto expense. Right. And you didn't, all you had to do was keep up with the mileage. You didn't have to save any receipts at all. So Got that's it. why. And so the more, the higher that business mileage number, the bigger that deduction is. Yeah. Cause right you now know? I'm pulling in um, what for, I know, I think in December of last year, I did over 2,100 miles. Okay. So for that, in December was, a, but I'll use the, the current. So that would have given you for that month a mileage or auto expense deduction of eleven hundred and seventy six dollars. Gotcha. So that's, I mean, but the key here is, and it's it's almost unbelievable, um, not unbelievable. It's so important that you keep up with this business mileage. And so right. um, it may not seem like a big deal, but when you start to add this mileage up times that 56 cents mm -hmm. a mile, that deduction starts to add up that you get right. the write off for in the business. Okay. And just so you'll know, um, one of the, one of the platforms that a lot of notaries use is called snap docs. Okay. And it allows us to, put our um, orders in there, even orders that don't come through that platform. So we okay. get orders from another platform, we put them in there and it gives us um, a round trip mileage oh, for wonderful. each order. So that's what I've been giving you each year is yes. I go through and I just add up Correct. all the mileage that I've done. And it says, okay, here's what you've done in mileage, you know? Um, and then there's some apps um some of the on the notary systems they actually will just record one way oh yes <laughs> yeah you yeah, record one way but you got to come back home because yes, a lot of absolutely. time we got to <clears throat> do you know do the closeout of the order right so i tend to go with what um the snap docs does because it actually shows you the round trip for that order and this is good for a lot of notaries who are living out in the mountain areas or a wide spread area where they, I know some notaries that have one way is an hour for them yes. of driving, you know? Yes. So them being able, and that's why I tell them to put their, you know, you got to keep track of it. And snap docs is one way of being able to keep track of those miles. And of course, um, the mileage apps and everything, you know, yeah. and you can set those mileage apps up to have different categories. So as you're driving, you can say, okay, well, this trip was business. This trip was personal. And at the end of the year, you'll have a whole list of everything that you did that was business because right. um, some of the notary instructors out there, they teach that, you know, also keep up with the miles that you go to the person's house, then you come back home, 
And then you have to go to FedEx. You have to sometimes go or go to UPS and those trips too, that you need to keep track of those yes. little small stops here, you know, that you're doing and all of that. So, you know, so that's good information for them. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point. It's not just the trips of going to a client that's business miles. So anytime you, you've got to go to the bank, uh, to make a deposit, if you've got to go to the post office, uh, if you've got to go to Office Depot or wherever you might buy office supplies from, um, any mileage related to the business is business miles. And so the thing that you want to do is, uh, is like in these apps, they also generally allow space to put some details in there okay. as to what the nature of the business was. Right. And so as long as you are documenting what the nature of the business was, and the other thing, uh, you, all, you you tend to have some automatic backup, mm -hmm. you know, whether you realize it or not. If you're going to a client, there were documents that prove you went. Correct. <laughs> if you're going to Office Depot, you more than likely bought something and there's right. a receipt that shows that you went, you went there. If Correct. you went to the bank, mm -hmm. you got a bank uh, uh, deposit or Slip. receipt mm -hmm. that. So um, it's easy to, to keep track of what the business purpose is because you tend to have some receipts. Correct. Um, and so even if you went in the office depot and they didn't have what you were looking for that day, it's still business mileage. Correct. You couldn't make them have what you needed that day. Right. Um, and so, um, but, you know, just document every, you know, thing that's re remotely related to the business. Um, and, you know, it becomes business mileage. And, you know, the, the more you add that up, times that 56 cents a mile. And again, that, that's option A. So option B, you still got to keep up with all your business mileage. <clears throat> the on, the difference is, or the big difference is, the big difference is, under option B, you actually got to keep every receipt um, that's related to the operation of the vehicle. <clears throat> okay. So, all right, so that means every time you get gas, you got to save those. Every time you get a tune-up, every time you get tires, every time any kind of repair, um, any and every receipt that's related to the operation of that vehicle, you need to keep up with. So then what you do is, now you what you got to do is figure out, let's say your total mileage for the year including all the mileage, business and personal, let's say was uh, 12,000 miles. Let's say for the year you drive a total of 12,000 miles. Mm -hmm. Now, of that 12,000, 6,000 of that was business miles. All right. So you have kept up with all of these little gas tickets and uh, mm -hmm. all, you added all, you did some, even if you're doing um uh, detailing, having detailing done to your car. Okay, That's part of the operation and maintenance of the car. So you add all these things up and under this uh, example, 50% of all those things is now what your business deduction is Okay, for, for your auto. Gotcha. So under option A, you don't keep up with the receipts. Okay. You simply take the standard mileage rate, which is point five, six times your business mileage. Under option B, you got to keep track of all of these different little pieces of paper and you take the business percentage of whatever that is. So okay. that percentage, there's no set percentage. It's what your percentage is based on where you live and mm -hmm. where your clients are. Okay. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you got a couple of different vehicles, you still, you know, it's the, the same scenario. Okay. And so you get to choose uh, which method works best for you. Gotcha. And now, 
Now, for me, you know, I'm, I'm renting right. <laughs> and everything. And there are a few people, um, depending on where they're living at, they, um, I know some notaries have to catch an Uber or a Lyft. So I guess they would need to keep the receipts for that, <clears throat> that, that and everything. Um, yep. And then with the renting, because um, I know I was talking to a gentleman and him and his wife, they have one vehicle. And <clears throat> I think she's in a medical field. So her schedule is a little fluid. And mm -hmm. on certain days, he needs to, you know, uh, make sure that she's accommodated to get to work at a certain time. Right. And all of that. And I was sharing with him, I said, you may want to consider if you know that, OK, this weekend, my wife is going to be at the hospital, maybe plan to have your rental car, get your small rental car. So if you need to hit the road and that way, you don't have to worry about not being able to pick up your wife on time. Right, correct, correct. And then you can go out there and all of that. So is there a certain <clears throat> percentage that a person can deduct or how when it comes to the rental car? Because like me right now, I'm doing it. It's 100% um, every month. That's what I'm we're using for our main vehicle. And primarily now, um, since I'm not working the 1099, the, um, not 1099, but the W-2 job, I'm primarily in the vehicle for notary related work or the wife has it if she needs to go do her cosmetology school work. And right. the personal side is primarily when we just go to the grocery store. <laughs> right. You know, that's pretty much it. You know, we're not, you know, taking family trips at the time and all that kind of stuff. So is there any kind of minimum, maximum amount when it comes to renting a car? No, it isn't. You you get to choose. I mean, so it like the expenses of, uh, so it doesn't matter if you're renting an Uber mm -hmm. uh, to get around. It doesn't matter if you're buying a car mm -hmm. or if Big Mama loans you her, you know, other vehicle. Yeah. There's mileage that you incur. Gotcha. And so there's, you get to decide based on the nature of your business and your personal situation as to, um, what your structure needs to look like. Now, they also won't tell you. So let's say you like you rent a uh, uh, um, SUV now. Right. All right. So as your business grows and you want to um, build printers or, you know, laptops or whatever that are mounted in the vehicle, mm -hmm. you might decide to buy a more expensive vehicle. Mm -hmm. That's that's your choosing. Okay. You know, there's nothing that says you got to buy the cheapest vehicle on the market. Right. To do business in. Gotcha. Uh, now the business needs to be able to support that. Don't, you know, right. don't, <laughs> don't say that the, your, the business is bringing in, has brought in $500 for the year. Uh, and you went and bought a Lexus. Right. To do business in. Because if you only brought in $500, the, the IRS is not going to let you write off. Because you you didn't use the Lexus for a hundred percent business if you only right. generated five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars, gotcha. Right. So okay. you know, so there are decisions like that that I I'm able to help you decide at the time you need to okay. decide those. Just like okay. over the years, you you mm -hmm. you say, hey Rob, I need to I got need to you got you know thirty minutes. So uh, I'm this is my plan. I'm thinking about doing, and Correct. then together, based on what you tell me, your plan is. I then tell you, hey, I think you need to buy. I think you need to rent. Mm -hmm. I think so. I'm able to help you make those kinds of decisions at the time you need to make them. Right. And right now, renting, because um, I'm generating the income to Correct. cover the, the rent, of the, right. the renting of the vehicle. And because the money that I'm actually saving on the car maintenance side of the house Correct. has really, you know, I mean, you talked about that and you said, well, if you're not paying the maintenance on it and it was like, okay, then if I got rid of the vehicle, if stop renting, incur a, a lower monthly payment, true, of say $300 a month. But with as much miles as I'm <clears throat> putting on the vehicle, I would literally need to have an oil change every other month and probably a transmission flush every month, <laughs> you right. know, 
with the amount um, and not to count, you know, then you're talking about the property taxes and then the yeah. tires and all of that kind of stuff. So after me and you talked, I was like, okay, I got out of my man pride of not having my own <laughs> vehicle. And I said, let me go ahead on and continue to work this because when I looked at the amount of um, money that I was saving that I didn't have to do maintenance. Now I'll be honest, it has made me really work <laughs> because mm-hmm. I know that I have to pay that, that bill. Correct. <clears throat> you know, um, but that, that, that was part of kind of pushing you to make the commitment. Correct. Yeah, it may. Yeah, I had, <clears throat> I had to make that commitment because even back when I was doing the Grubhub stuff, you know, um, I was like, okay, I need to at least do enough Grubhub to pay for the car rental and anything. Right. <clears throat> excuse me, and anything after that, I'm good. You know, that's just extra. Right. So way back then, I got into the habit of making sure I could earn enough money with my side hustle stuff that I was doing back then to make sure that I could cover that rental <clears throat> car. And then when I went into the business of doing notary, it was just, it, it just flowed and it wasn't a stressful thing. And now, cause back then I used to just pay weekly. Now I can actually afford to pay for the whole month. Not right. that it's any cheaper, but you know, it gets tiresome every week you calling them saying, Hey, extend it, <laughs> extend it, extend it. And you hoping that money. So now I got it to where I can just go in there <laughs> And say, okay, I'm written for the whole month. I'll see y'all in 30 days. Well, the other th- <clears throat> the other thing is you talked about repairs. Mm-hmm. If if this rental you have goes belly up, you tell them <laughs> I need another one. Correct. And that's <laughs> what happened. And that's yeah. and that recently happened. Um I was driving from a client's house going to another client, <clears throat> and the tire all of a sudden said you're at 27% air pressure. I'm like, okay, slow leak, maybe, okay, got it. Then it went down to 21%, um, mm-hmm. 21 PSI. Next thing I know, it went down to 17 mm-hmm. PSI. I was like, whoa. So I just happened to be off of Rosemont Road where there was one of those quick fix tire places. Right. And I rode in there and come to find out there was a gash on the side of the um, tire that they couldn't fix. So I contacted the um, enterprise, the people put a new, put um, the donut on for me. I paid them five, they they only charged me $5 to do that. And then I went over to enterprise and then they switched me out into another car, just like that. And I didn't, cause that guy said, so do you want to pay for this car tire to get fixed? I'm like, no, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, everybody brag about that car shield thing, but I'm like, I got enterprise. I ain't got to pay yeah. for no repairs, That's you right. know? And I just took it to enterprise and they was like, oh, no problem. Switched me out into another SUV and kept going. Okay. You know, so it has been truly, uh, you know, a blessing and what helps us out is that my oldest son has a vehicle <clears throat> so i'm on his title which allows us to continue to keep the car insurance right since i'm on his title and everything you know he pays for the car and all that but it also helps him out with the insurance um being that at the time he was under 26 years old right so he's 26 now but it's an all-around win-win so i told people if you do go rental car, you may want to have uh, maybe just a little a little hoopty or something yeah, that you just, can keep in your driveway that can be, you know, pass your state inspections and all of that. And you just use that as a get around car. And then you use the um, the rental car because that rental car insurance is expensive yes. um, between 14 and 21 dollars a day. But if you have decent car insurance, um, you can it'll cover a lot of the stuff. And right. when I contacted all state and checked with them, they said, you'll be covered. If you get in a car accident, we'll cover you. Right. And I said, okay, so there was no need for me to pay for, you know, rental cars coverage from them and all of that. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Back to all you. Right. <laughs> so we'll, next we'll move on, move to talking about cell phone expense. Okay. You know, so self, quite a few people asked about uh, are they able to deduct the cell phone? So 
the thing I uh, recommend with people is um, kind of like your personal, uh, like your vehicle. If you you have that vehicle and you're using it for business, it's not likely that you use it 100. percent So your cell phone is similar. You you got some, you're getting some personal calls on there. You know, so. Um, yep, that's right. Correct. <laughs> if if you, it, it, I don't suggest that you claim a hundred percent cell phone expense. You know, you kind of got to look at how involved are you in the business. Again, everything is relative. So again, it, if you're only making five hundred dollars for the year, don't don't say you, you know, you uh, got twenty five hundred dollars of cell phone expense. Right. <clears throat> I mean, you weren't doing that much business because you only made five hundred dollars. Right, right. So you have to be practical with yeah, the deductions. So a lot of this has to do with what's relative to your situation. Like you, you'll hear some things. You know, a cell phone expense is deductible. Yep. A uh, 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 automobile expense is deductible. Yes. So there's certain things that are deductible but they're also relative to your situation. And your situation is not exactly the same as the next person. Correct. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's better. <laughs> <coughs> Better, a whole lot better. <laughs> okay, so again, everything is kind of a <clears throat> rel relative situation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where I come in, you mm -hmm. know, with people to help them figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the best thing for you? Because you can't relate your situation to the next person because their situation is different. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so cell phone is just kind of a, a, a kind of a simple thing. You just got to look at it and, and decide what's a reasonable number what, or what's a reasonable amount of that bill mm -hmm. you know, to, that you're taking a deduction for. Another big one um, deduction is probably the majority of uh, mobile notaries operate from home. Okay. So many ask the question is, uh, what about, and it's called business use of the home. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you uh, get to take deduction for, you know, because you you got to do some paperwork somewhere. Right. And um. So what you have to do with that is, is look at the amount of square feet of the space that you're using. And IRS's rules are is that you're using it exclusively and regularly for business. Mm -hmm. Now, so if all you have is the kitchen table to operate, mm -hmm. you're not using that kitchen, you're not using the kitchen exclusively for business right okay gotcha. now so if you got a, a, a area of a, a room or a room that you use in a, as an office what you do is take the square foot of that space that you're using regularly and exclusively for business mm -hmm. so let's say that is um let's say it's a 10 what is that? Uh, a mm -hmm. 10 by. 19. Yeah. So let's say it's a 130 square foot room mm -hmm. that you got to file cabinets and your desk and your you know laptop and, and printer and all of that in there. So. And so that space is 130 square feet. But let's say and it doesn't matter. It does not matter if you're in an apartment, a townhouse, uh, a mansion. Uh, <laughs> um, it doesn't matter and so 
you know, so when they say home, it doesn't mean that you have to own the home. Gotcha. It simply means that's where you live at. Okay. Makes sense. So you take, <clears throat> excuse me. So in the analogy we were using, you take that 130 square feet. So let's say um, the total square feet of the, uh, um, of the total square feet of the, the apartment, the townhouse, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, let's say it's a thousand square feet. What that means is that means 13% of your, and there's two ways um, to do, just as with auto, is two ways to do business use of the home. Mm -hmm. At either rate, you got to know what the amount of square feet is that you're using. You understand. Okay. So under option A, you're using um, 130 square feet. Okay. Under option A, you simply take 130 square feet times in the IRS um, short version is five dollars okay so you take the 130 square feet so your home office deduction is 650 dollars for the year okay so you simply take and let's say you're using two rooms mm -hmm. if you double that it would just be double that number or, you know, whatever your square foot, I'm just using, correct. you know, an example. So, um, so let's say, and it, or it's a bigger space or you use in the basement or, you know, and it, and it's 30, um, and, uh, let's say this, it's 300 square feet. I'm just, you know, picking different numbers times the $5 a square foot, mm -hmm. your office deduction or is $1,500 for the year. Gotcha. So if that's the case, you could divide that by 12 and each month you could, uh, you know, t take a $125 rental, or it wouldn't be rental, but office uh, deduction, you know, on your profit and loss or on your tax return. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Now, under option B, kind of similar to the car, you take your mortgage interest, your real estate tax, the homeowners um, insurance, mm -hmm. add up all the utilities, add up the repairs that are related specifically to that part of the house. Mm -hmm. So let's say again, it's uh, in the first example, uh, you we used 130 square feet. Okay. The whole place was a thousand square feet. So you total up all of these things and you get to deduct 13% of them. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So again, kind of like auto, auto expenses mm -hmm. for many people, they don't want to have to keep up with all of the different receipts, pieces, and, all of receipts that. and everything. So gotcha. they just take the standard rate because okay. the, the square feet ain't going to change keeping up with all the pieces of paper. <laughs> right. I ain't gonna say we'll change, but you'll lose half of them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two options to do that. Okay. Excellent. That makes sense. All right. So all of these things I'm I'm sharing with you, um, many of them have a few more details, but this ain't the platform to. Mm -hmm. To kind of go into because ev everybody's right. situation is different. Correct. So, um, it, it might have five parts to it, and I've hit the main three or th four. Mm -hmm. Cause if I go and start going into the other couple parts, it starts to, um, because everybody's situation is different, we start to get into some details that aren't necessary at this point. You right. know, so no, that makes those sense. Are the I'm details. Agree. Yeah, that those are the details that I help you with. I, this last one, we didn't get a chance to talk about 
uh, on the last Zoom, but mm -hmm. you and I have talked about this, and this is what I call the the huge tax savings for you know notary signing agents, and that is all the money that you <coughs> make as a notary, a mm -hmm. mobile notary, is subject to income tax. Right. It's part of your gross income. Mm -hmm. But in Virginia, for every time you have a uh, um, a seal or mm -hmm. a notary stamp. Uh, we put a, you stamp. stamp on that's what yeah. I'm, I was looking for. Stamp. <laughs> yeah. Every time you have to apply your stamp, and I think, and sometimes depending on how many documents you may have, is kind of give me an idea how many sometimes. Um, you have. Yeah. On average, when I did the 2019, on average, I was doing 13 stamps per document. Okay. I was literally doing 13 stamps per document. And um and then you know we was allowed to deduct that five dollars per stamp off of the self-employment tax part, correct? But you don't have to pay self-employment tax. Employment tax on. Correct. Right. So <laughs> right. all of the income is included at the top number, your gross income. Mm -hmm. And then you take the deductions from that. But you you got to keep those two things separately mm -hmm. because if you don't, you'd end up paying self-employment tax on your total net income. Right. So you've had all of these seals based on how many different client documents. So IRS allows you to not have to pay self-employment tax on the amount of seals because they call you a public servant. That's, that's right. That's IRS's whole uh, what they, mm -hmm. the term they call it. So when you're being a public servant, which means when you've applied your seal to the number of documents. Mm -hmm. So I think you mentioned to me, there's, there's also software that you have that allows you to keep track. Correct. Uh, how many uh, actual seals you have, and you need to give that to your accountant. Um, right when they're preparing your return so that you um, pay a lot less in self-employment tax. Correct. Correct. Um, yes. Yes. Um, I can share on my screen so people can get a, a okay. semi view understanding of what we're talking about. All right. Um, and let me do this here. All right, so. All right, so in this here example, as you see, I'm just covering this side over here. I'm just covering up people's names right. and stuff. Right, right. But as it shows here, there was 10 documents that I had to do. There was... um. 10 because in, in Virginia we do it for each time we stamp. Um Correct. in some states they go by per signature. So we don't do per signature here. Okay. And everything. So basically the gross on this here order was 85, and I had fifty dollars in notarial fees, right. and the net that gets reported is 35. Correct. And then here, this this here item was fifty dollars. There was two stamps that I had to do on it, and the net was forty, and so forth and so on. So even here, this was one twenty five. I had fifty dollars in stamping that I did, and the net that gets reported is seventy five. So that gets reported to the SC and Correct. and everything. So like this one here. Um, was 12 and the item was $90 and the net that gets um, reported is 30. So, and then like this one here, this was more than likely a loan application, which there's nothing to notarize on loan applications. So okay. that's just a straight 70 I made and I had to pay, you know, pay self-employment tax on a full amount. Okay. <laughs> and that's what these are showing here. Um, because back then I was doing a lot of loan applications okay. and stuff, um, you know, and all of those I had to pay, you know, paid the full amount on. And then right. like on this one, 
I had um forty dollars mm-hmm. in stamping, and I only ended up with a net of ten. Right. You know that it needed to be reported. So that's the the benefit of it and a lot of notaries don't understand that part and when right. i first started i didn't understand it either um because it's not really talked about with amongst the notaries you know especially throughout the year the only time they mention it is when tax time come yeah and if you're not in the right know-how yes you won't know right yeah. you know so then now the the other side of the house like this company, this one is called Notary Assist, and there's another one called Notary Gadget. I don't know which one is better. Um, I just started with Notary Assist, and I just keep going with them. I got you. So whoever, you know, I tell, and I'm saying this for the notaries, whichever one you want to use, you use. Um, just make sure you take advantage of the, the of that part of it. Um, now, if you're doing e-notary stuff, <coughs> that's a different beast because we get to um, deduct in Virginia $25 per stamp. Right. That's so it. one of the things that I talked to the owner of notary assist, I said, so how do I calculate that? They said, I would have to go out of the automatic mode that they're mm-hmm. in and do the manual mode of, you know, putting in the $5 or the 25. Right. When I'm doing the e-notary stuff. I said, okay, gotcha. So um, yeah. And that thing, you know, when I saw the end result of what I had to report to right. you That's based off of that, sense. I was like, oh, snap, <laughs> you know, now I'll be honest, it took some time because I had to go in and put everything in there. And there was some yeah. late, late nights of going in there and going back and getting all that stuff put in there. But you got to um, it was worth it. Well, I think the big keys is. um, uh you got a lot of people who are starting out. So if you establish these good habits and patterns and you Mm -hmm. be consistent, you you don't end up waiting till the end of the year and trying to backtrack, Mm -hmm. you know, so you is the paperwork is the part you got to find time to do. Right. I mean, you'll make the money, Mm -hmm. but if you don't keep track of the paperwork, you can get lost in it. Correct. Correct. You know, so I, I think those are the, um, you know, all of the, 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 the main subject areas that folks had questions about. Mm-hmm. Um, I am available. I'm going to, um, Actually, I'm in the process of kind of formalizing these notes that we just I just spoke from. I'm going to send these to you. Gotcha. Um, and to give folks something, um, and uh, um, you know, I th- think you sent out to them. Um, you know, my contact information. Correct. Um, I am uh, available. Um, you know, it's tax time right now. Mm-hmm. I'm available to to help you get your tax return done. I'm also available, um, you know, to do this, to keep track of your profit and loss stuff on a monthly basis so gotcha. that you know where you are, mm-hmm. um, um, you know, so that you can have the information that you need to make good business decisions with. You know, a lot of times people look at it and say, well, you know, uh, I can't afford to do, uh, you know, I, I can't afford to, to buy something or to, to pay something. Mm-hmm. And m- my recommendation to them is you really can't afford not to. Mm-hmm. You know, I end up saving you way more money than you pay me. Correct. And you have. <laughs> For us, yes. it, ha- it has truly, truly worked out. Um, all the advice that you've given us, um, like when I first started working out of town and I had to pay, I think one time I had to pay like $6,000 in taxes because yeah. my income went up and you said simply, you ain't got enough deductions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you told me. And you yeah. said, you said, and, uh, we'll be here to, at the same in, right. in pass again, if yeah. you don't get some additional deductions. Right. And 
we wasn't able to add any deductions, but I understood that I was going to have a tax liability. Right. So it and wasn't other, shocking. Go ahead. So it wasn't that shocking the second year <laughs> when right. I still had to owe because I already understood what the deal was. And then we finally got our deductions tweaked to where really for that second year, it was less that we owed. We still yes. owed, but we it went from like 6,000 down to half, about right. just about three. And I was like, okay, I'm understanding how this thing works now. Right. So, um, and then even last year, when I submitted all the, the stuff with the tax thing, I think we ended up on even less. We still owe, but it wasn't as much as previous years. So, right. you know, your advice has helped us out. And some people are like, well, man, you still owe. It's not the tax guy's <laughs> fault yeah. that I owe. It's not his fault that I owe. It was right. that I just didn't have the deductions. Yeah, I had deductions, but not enough to where it would reduce what I owed. And right. once you understand that, then you have to decide, okay, well, how do I get additional deductions? Or you're like, I'm tapped out. I just going to, I'm just going to have to owe. Or, you know, one of the things I, um, you know, once I've done it and I see where you are, you know, I recommend that if, if, uh, that you set up and pay estimated tax. Correct. I mean, it, when you're an employee, mm -hmm. you're paying as you go. Right. Sometimes as a business owner, that's what you got to do. Right. So, you know, the things that I'm able to sit down with you and help you figure out, I can point out some deductions that you're not even aware of. So mm -hmm. that's one thing that gives you additional deductions. Um, uh, but sometimes, as you just pointed out, you tapped out in terms of what things you can deduct. You simply have made enough money. Mm hmm that there's some taxes that are due right that you know I, i'm i'm not the maker of the news mm -hmm. i report the news right you bring the information and i put it in a report and report the news and there are people sometimes they think well i'm in business so i shouldn't have to pay taxes no <laughs> that's not the case right uh, my job is to help you pay the least amount of tax that you can pay mm-hmm but that doesn't mean that you don't get to pay any tax. Right. And so I'm, I'm going to share something with you that may seem counterproductive. I tell people I want a tax, big tax bill and they look at me kind of strange. Well, the purpose, that means I've made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So now do I, you know, do I meet that mark? But that's my strategy. Right. My strat make as much money as you can make. There are okay. people who look at this and say, well, I shouldn't have made as much money. No, don't ever not make money. Right. Figure out the strategy to make the money. Mm -hmm. Let me help you figure out the strategy as to how you manage the money. Right. But don't ever, I, I run across people quite often and say, I shouldn't have made as much. No, because you use the money. Yes. So making the additional money actually change your lifestyle. Correct. What we need to sit down together and do and figure out how do we need to manage this mm -hmm. so that you get a different result at the end. Gotcha. The thing I'm good at helping you do. Yeah. Let's let's together sit down and figure out this is your situation. What's the result that you would like to get? Let's figure out how to get there. Okay, good. Now to close out, uh, which I forgot to do in the beginning. <clears throat> Give them a little bit of your history and your background so they understand. Okay. I, okay. I am a former, let me reemphasize, re re former IRS agent. So I learned from the best. I was trained and all from the best. The difference is I'm by nature a helping, giving person. So I enjoy being on this side of my desk as opposed to being on the other side where my job was to, I call it beat people across the head for money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've been in this business now for right at 30 years. The main thing I do is help people make good business decisions. Gotcha. So 
how I that is sit down with you, finding out where you are mm -hmm. and finding out where it is that you would like to be. Gotcha. And I help you come up with a strategy to help you get to where it is you want to be. Excellent. That could be helping you. How do we figure out how to generate more sales? How do we figure out how to, uh, you know, come up with more deductions? How mm -hmm. do we, you know, or if we got the net income, what kind of things can we do with that net income that will give you a better uh, result? I understand. So uh, I am here all year long. Um, the biggest part of what I do is teach and educate folks so that you understand and have a better idea of what you're doing in your business. I understand. And so I do that through taxes. I do it, uh, you know, um, I have uh, several clients who I do monthly bookkeeping and accounting. And if you're in business, that's really the best way to, to, to do this. So that on a regular monthly basis, you have a sense of where you are, mm -hmm. you know, because otherwise there's cash flow, there's mm -hmm. money coming in and there's, it's moving and you get to the end. And oftentimes you're trying to figure out it was moving, but it's gone. Right. So, <laughs> Let's, let's manage it on a regular monthly basis and, and managing it, you get to look at it and say, well, do I need to increase this? Do I need to mm -hmm. be, you know, reduce that? Well, the only way you know to do that is you doing it on a regular basis. Right. And so uh, that's what I do. I'm, I'm here. The other big part of what I do, um, I pride myself in my professional ethics that you'll never hear me mention a name of a client mm -hmm. because your situation, now you get to tell them, but I don't. Right. And so, um, you know, my professional ethics, uh, I, you know, uh, oftentimes I have family members and they don't even know that I'm doing the other family members information gotcha. because that's not my place to say correct and so um i'm very reasonable um i own the business so i don't have this huge you know marketing you know platform and so uh, and every year i'm uh doing surveys to make sure that my fees stay below all these other people gotcha. yeah fees. and it's been very affordable for us throughout the whole what 20 years we've been working with you. Yes. Yeah. So it's been money well spent um, and worth every, every dime. Um, it is, it's been a godsend for me because I just didn't feel like doing any more taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like messing with them no more. So cool. Well, you know, and, and I'll close with this, you know, the thing you have to look at is do you, one, do you have the knowledge? Do you have the time? Mm -hmm. Um, or do you have the resources? Right. You know, so you got to look at and see where you fit in there. And, you know, oftentimes it's better to spend money, to spend your time making money, mm -hmm. to pay for the things that you either don't want to do, don't have mm -hmm. time to do, or don't know how to do. Gotcha. That's where I come in. Correct. You get to give what I call your headache and you get, give that to me. And this mm -hmm. is the part I love to do. I, I like to take your chaos and make mm -hmm. order of it. And then gotcha. give it to you. Excellent. Well, Rob, thank you for your time. Um, I'll make sure everybody has your contact information okay. and um, really appreciate it. And people, thank y'all very much for viewing. Uh, we just wanted to just get some good basic information out there to everybody to help you make the best decisions for your business. So, Look in the comment section in the description. You'll see Rob's information. Reach out to him. He can handle people for all 50 states. So your, your location is not a problem. All right. That's Thank right. y'all. Y'all have a good one. Peace. Thanks.